we will be today talking on talking about tokenization of you know, data assets on a blockchain. And uh, this work is jointly done with uh, Dr. Heiko, who is with us here. So the problem to solve, so if you look at it, look here, we have the building and its owner on the left-hand side. And then you have a couple of people who are interested in building data. And uh, they ask the building data for building data from the building owner. So the first time you ask, the owner may be altruistic and decided to give the information. Second time, the owner might be your friend and still might give you some more information. But this process is uh, neither scalable or sustainable. So we need to have a mechanism where this information can be made available to the public, either for data analytics or for other personal use of this building information. And how do we solve this? So one possible solution is to incentivize the building owner. So this can be uh, done by providing some monies to the building owner by the consumer of information. And then the building owner might be willing to actually give this information to the consumer, but in a well-organized, sustainable and scalable manner. So what we effectively do is very simple. We just try to bridge the gap between the buyer and the seller. So the seller here, seller here is going to be the building owner and the buyer of information can be a data analytics company or any other person who is, inform, who is interested in this building information. And we also are interested in tokenizing. So the whole purpose of uh, tokenizing is to coordinate the activities between the buyer and the seller using tokens. So um, then the next question would be, what building data are we interested in? There are a couple. So we, we give four examples here. And the first one, it can be on the disassembly and uh, reuse information of the building. If you look at the right hand side, you can see that there are various building components and uh, some of them can be pillars and it's some, some other useful information that is uh, required that can be reused when at the time of deconstruction of the building. So along with that, uh, so along with the reusable material information, this includes the quantity of the uh, reusable material, its quality, uh, where it is located in the building, and also the disassembly information is required. And this also can be converted into a data asset. What else can we convert into a data asset? Um, another example is the uh, monthly utility bill. So if you look at the image on the right, you have the electricity bill and the water bill. And uh, there's also historic information about the usage of these two services in the previous couple of months. So this is another thing that can be converted into an asset. And the question who may be interested in it, it can be any of the new building tenants. They might be interested in the historic usage and what's going to cost them. Or it could be, it could be the case that uh, the, the building owner has decided to install electricity saving bulbs and he wants to do a comparison of the power usage before and after installation of those bulbs. So this is another example of the building data that can be transformed into an asset. Um, yet another example is the electric wiring diagram in the building or an apartment. So from time to time, um, the electric system might need maintenance. You might want to add new things and you hire a contractor. And now the issue here is that all the wiring is behind plastered walls. So that means that the contractor is going to have to spend some time finding where the wires are and uh, deciphering it. So instead, if the electric wiring diagram was already available to them, the job would have been much easier and faster. So the electric wiring diagram is another example of the building information that can be converted into a data asset. 
Um, same goes with plumbing. So again, you have all the pipes running behind the walls, and some of them are underground. And you might not accidentally want to break any of the pipes when you dig, dig up stuff. So if you know what the pipes are and know the exact location of where it is, this is another useful information that can be uh, transformed into a data asset. So we have seen four examples of what possible uh, data building data can be converted into an uh, asset. And uh, so we move on to the next question, who owns the building data? In this case, uh, there are usually two people, two, two types of entities. It can simply be the building owner who owns the building data, or this information can be sold to a data asset uh, management company. And they might be interested in specialized, they might be specialized in managing this kind of information. So in case it's an asset management company, then they can uh, get the data from the different building owners and aggregate it and uh, have more information available. So if we were to build an ecosystem around it, the stakeholders can be the building owner or the asset management company who's interested in providing such information, or it can be a hybrid. So you can have some individual building owners and also some asset management companies uh, as part of the ecosystem where we built uh, the data asset information collection mechanism. So uh, the next question would then be, what are the requirements of a data asset? Typically, there are five. So the first one is that uh, the data asset uh, must not be duplicated. So this is quite um, simple to understand. For example, if you have a $1 bill, if you can simply copy it, then there is uh, no value in it. So the, it should not be possible to arbitrarily duplicate any asset. So this is clearly one of the requirements of, of a data asset. And the next one, um, it's about control. For on a house, you have, you have the door, you have the lock, you probably have multiple locks. So clearly you need to have exclusive, you need to be able to take possession and exclusive control of the information and also as its owner, possible to accumulate, uh, hold, delegate, rent, or sell the property. So control is another crucial aspect of what uh, a data asset should be able to do and hence this requirement. And uh, the other thing is that if required, it should be subjected to regulatory authority. So, excuse me. In this sense, it gives um, the data object legitimacy for the relevant jurisdiction. And it's quite common that many of the items that we have are regulated. And if they are not regulated, people might be skeptic to be part of that ecosystem. So in some cases, regulation is uh, required. And if regulation is required by the authority, this is one of the requirements that needs to be supported. And the fourth one, uh, the data asset should be auditable. So it should be possible to verify the integrity of the data and also test for any impairments in it. And the final one, it's that, um, is that the data asset should be able to provide, uh, generate and extract useful information. And it can be purchased and consumed by third parties. So being able to generate a source of revenue. So if you look on the right side image, you can see a couple of databases and they hold some information. So they are passed through a funnel, all the information is collected, processed, turned, and at the end of the funnel, you have useful information coming out. So that can be in the form of data that can be used for analytics or other purposes. And the other important thing is that uh, the, there should be a monetary an exchange of money between the part that produces the data and the other part which is consuming this data. So it should definitely be able to generate a source of revenue. So these are the five uh, requirements that we impose on a data asset. And once we do that, uh, 
we come to see what exactly a building data asset is. So building data, data asset is a data asset that we've already seen, and then it also provides a building domain specific API so that it can interact and uh, manipulate the data. So if you look at the image, you have some consumer of the data on the right side, and the data is available on a database on the far left side. So since this is an asset, now there needs to be an incentive for this data to be made available. So we use a play payment platform for that. So the first step would be then for the consumer of this information to pay this payment platform. And once the payment has been made, uh, they can request the domain specific API for the uh, data from the database. So the next step would simply to be um, verify if the payment has been made. So they can check the payment platform and see if the monies have been paid. And uh, there's also business logic involved. So this is to decide has enough money been paid? Does the amount of money subpaid support the information queried and so on? So once that's done, uh, the information can be fetched from the database, building data. It can be fetched from the database on the left-hand side and set it back uh, in step five. So you send back this information back to the consumer. And uh, that's step five. Okay. So what then is, uh, so what we have seen what a building data asset is now. And then the next question is, what is a tokenized building data asset and uh, why do we need it? So as we said, uh, tokenization has uh, two benefits. Uh, one is to coordinate the activities. And second is to simply simplify things in the ecosystem. So if you look at the top right, you can see a couple of tokens. Um, tokens are simply a unique string. So uh, you have two strings on the top part right, and each of them have an address. And in this case, it's an address pointer to where this information is located. And you can see that you have two tokens on the right, and then on the database, they point to separate uh, data on the database. So in that sense, uh, this is a bit more fine-grained. You can point it to bits and parts of the information that you want instead of pointing it to a, a single larger uh, larger part of data. So once you have the address for the token, then there's a way to resolve this address so that it can be found in a database. So that's the uh, address, that's the role of the address solver. And at the uh, bottom right, as, pre as before, we have the uh, web browser, but instead of making a direct payment, you can, in this case, pay the specific tokens. So in this case, the web browser consumer, in step one, paste the, uh, paste the token on the top, and the token is uh, referenced by a unique identifier. And once the token has received the payment, the payment is sent to the uh, payment platform. And then as we have seen earlier, you can, in step three, request the information from the domain specific API. Then there'll be a verify the payment and then the business logic will uh, try to see if the payment requirements have been met, the information is fetched and sent back to the web browser consumer. So the example we have of tokens we have, we have talked just now, the examples of non-fungible tokens or NFTs. And we are not even talking about a blockchain here. So the idea is that these tokens have unique IDs. So that's why they, that makes them non-fungible in the, in, to the point that one token cannot be replaced by another token. So the case where you can replace one token with another token or fungible tokens is this like money, a $1 bill can be replaced with any other $1 bill and you still have the same value. But in this case, they are uniquely identified by the string and they point to the information in the database. Um, so the next question is, uh, why do we need a blockchain? So this can be a bit uh, tricky, but we will try to answer why do we use a blockchain instead. 
So to answer this question, uh, we need to first answer what tool best meets our requirements of the data set. And we quickly look at the recap of what requirements we need for the data set. So the first one is that uh, no duplicates are allowed. So uniqueness is a requirement here. And uh, does a blockchain meet this requirement? Yes, blockchain can detect and prevent duplicates. And how about any other solutions? Yes, again, any program can be, uh, any computer can be programmed to detect and prevent duplicates. So while the blockchain can meet this requirement, it doesn't have any specific advantage of any other mechanism or solution, but it still meets this requirement. And one of the second requirements of the data set is that a strong control feature. So in case of blockchain, a strong control feature is present. So you have the ability to hold, accumulate, and rent and sell property. And how about the other, other general solutions present out there? Yes, they can also do that, but uh, under weaker security assumptions. So in this case, uh, blockchain has an advantage of other solutions. So strong control features is a, is a requirement that is supported by the blockchain more than other solutions generally do. Um, the third one was uh, the bookkeeping of all transactions is a regulatory requirement. So does the blockchain have this requirement? Um, they do it quite well because you have multiple copies of the database stored across multiple locations on the internet. Um, they generally are better suited and they're also under a consensus mechanism to make sure that all of these databases have the same global view of the information. So there's a built-in mechanism for this in a blockchain uh, to do this, but in case of other solutions, if it is a standalone database, then there's a risk that this information can be lost when the database crashes, or if you have mirrored your, your databases, you still need to reconcile the information to get the final single view of the information held in the database. So again, the blockchain has a slight advantage here over other solutions because bookkeeping is uh, quite well done in the blockchain compared to the solutions. And uh, the other one is uh, tamper resistance and identity verification for audit. So again, uh, for blockchain, they are very good at uh, tamper resistance because of the nature of the consensus. Uh, the, they are very difficult to uh, tamper under the standard blockchain security assumptions. And every information that is being uh, recorded in the blockchain is digitally signed. So it's likely possible to know who signed it as long as that map is available. And how about other solutions? Yes, you could do this, but under a strong adversary model, it is not such a solution is not easily available as a single off the shelf solution. So there might be a bit of effort required to meet these requirements simultaneously, especially under a stronger adversary model. And uh, the last requirement um, was, is to be able to seamlessly and securely pay and purchase. So again, uh, on a blockchain, this is quite easy in the sense any trades can be carried out on a decentralized exchange. So in a decentralized exchange, just like in any other stock exchange, you have a buy wall and a sell wall, and you can buy and sell uh, using a decentralized exchange. And the important thing here is that they are decentralized and it's uh, the transactions are executed in a trust manner. So there is no central entity who is going to control control the transfer of uh, money here. How about other solutions? Yes, uh, typically they can be faster, but uh, maybe less seamless. And by seamless, I consider that if you can block, freeze, or lock assets, then um, it's not a preferable solution in many cases. So in that sense, uh, blockchain is able to seamlessly and securely pay.
And uh, the other question would then be, uh, does blockchain as a tool meet many of our requirements? So in some sense, yes, it's for example, if you, if you look at your smartphone here, smartphone in some sense is a mini computer, then uh, it can be used as a wallet. So you need to carry a wallet. I can, can, it also has the clock feature. I can check the time. I can plug in a radio jack and listen to FM radio. So in that sense, as a single tool, it is able to perform multiple functions satisfactorily. So then the question is, does the blockchain meet many of the requirements of a data asset? So we, as we have seen, yes, uh, it does not allow duplicate assets, and then it has better control over the data asset. And the bookkeeping for regulators is pretty good with the blockchain, and it also has excellent tamper resistance and identity verification for audit. And also on blockchain, you're able to seamlessly and securely pay and trade settlements on a smart contract. And on top of that, many blockchain natively supports tokens. So the point being that uh, blockchain as a single tool meets many of the requirements of a data set. And it also meets most of the service level agreements, uh, which is for our purpose. So that's the reason why we use blockchain as a tool to enable uh, data asset. So uh, our solution architecture using a blockchain. So in this case, uh, you have the building, you have the building owners. So the building owners are going to hire contractors and these contractors as part of their regular job, they're going to collect the information requested by the building owner. They're going to digitize it in a suitable format and hand it over to the building owners. So this is the first part. And what happens next? So the building owner actually makes a deal with the tokenizer. So the tokenizer can be an individual or a company. So the deal is that the building owner signs a legally binding contract uh, with this tokenizer to um, tokenize the building information into an asset. And the tokenizer here acts as the bridge between the physical world and the digital blockchain world. So based on the contract, legally by the contract sign, the tokenizer will issue a number of tokens. So if you look at the top right, so what is going to issue is a data, data set token or the NFT. And each NFT also, along with each NFT, he also makes a certain number of ownership tokens and economic tokens. So the purpose of ownership tokens is that you can sell fractional, a fraction of the ownership to somebody else. And the purpose of economic tokens is to raise, is to raise capital. So capital can be raised to power the costs of, uh, of hiring the contractors and getting this information digitized. It can also be partly used to pay the tokenizer and also to put this information on a data store. So eventually people can consume it, but they all cost uh, money and uh, this economic tokens uh, can then be issued to members of the public or to institutional investors. And in return, uh, the building owners are uh, paid for it. So that's step four. So for each NFT issue, there are such, there's a specific number of ownership and economic tokens also entered along with it. And then the next step. So the tokenizer, once the tokenizer mints it, this uh, tokens are sent back to the uh, building owner. And once that is done, the building owner has the economic tokens and ownership tokens with them. And when they need money or uh, they have this requirement that they might sell their apartment, then they might need, there might be a need for change of ownership. So some of these tokens actually can be sold. And uh, that's what we do here. So if you look at Pyway, they sell this fractional ownership tokens. So these tokens are sold on a decentralized exchange running on top of a, of a blockchain. And the new company owners, or it can even be the building 
building management company who is interested in the building information. So they can decide to buy these tokens uh, of the DEX. So by paying funds and funds are sent to the building owner. So this is how uh, ownership tokens are exchanged between the building owner and interested parties. Um, the other part in, involves economic tokens, and this is to raise capital. So they can be to sell economic tokens on a decentralized exchange. And uh, the people interested to buy this are the individual or institutional investors. So they can pay money to the debts and uh, buy these economic tokens, and uh, the monies are sent to the building on. So once this is done and the information is made available on the data store, then on the far right, you have people who are interested in this data. So the good thing now is that there's a mechanism that they can pay for it and get this data. So the first step is to query for the information. So we have a search platform that is part of the ecosystem here. And the result of the query is the asset, asset identifier. So as an identifier is simply the unique ID under which the information is available. So that's the data set here. So once you retrieve the asset identifier, you know which asset you need to pay for to get the relevant information. So that's what happens in step 7C. Once you know the asset identifier, you can send funds to that asset identifier. So this data asset is now on a blockchain. This is an NFT on the blockchain. You can pay this NFT, and, and once the payment has been uh, finalized on the blockchain, then you can actually um, request information for the data store. There's going to be a server wrapping around the data store, but it's not shown here. But anyway, um, once that is done, the data store will check if the payment is made. So it's simply query the uh, blockchain NFT to see if the payment has been made and the payment status is returned to the uh, server, uh, which has the data store behind it. And uh, if the payment is made, you simply provide the requested data and the license. So the license has the terms of use of the information. So there are two kinds of uh, uh, economic models here. So when you when the consumer requests funds uh, request information, they do not actually get the rights rights of ownership to this information. They simply have the rights to use this information, which means that under the license terms, they cannot sell the information to third party. But they are free to analyze it and use it for their own purpose. But if you want to sell something, that's the part where we have this fractional ownership. So the ownership, if the ownership tokens are sold, then only the ownership of that information is sold. But if you simply request some information in step seven, the information is not sold. You simply have a copy of the information there and uh, you're not allowed to uh, sell it depending on the license agreement as part of the data. So that's uh, step seven. So finally, the uh, consumer is able to query for the information and receive the information from the data store. So remember that in step seven, that the consumer had paid some money to the uh, data asset. So the next step would be then to distribute it to the token holders. So we have the ownership token holders and the economic uh, token holders. So what are funds you have been sending to this NFT? They are split proportionally between the economic uh, token holders and the ownership holders. So this is the royalty received for this holding these tokens. And that's the whole idea of step 8A and 8B. So they have a they have a benefit for holding these tokens. So this is the whole picture of the solution. So the whole idea is that as a consumer, you're able to uh, pay for this information and there's an incentive for the building owner to make this available information available. And then we have 
system of tokens and a decentralized exchange to coordinate the activities and to buy and sell these tokens so that the ecosystem is functional and sustainable. And uh, we also have the ownership tokens because you might have to sell ownership of information from time to time. And you also have economic tokens because uh, you may want to raise capital by using uh, token shares so that we are uh, we don't really have to entirely rely on other sources of income and and to make the system more self-sustaining. So uh, there's some more information on our work. So this is a preprint of the paper. The title is uh, Dance of the Davos, Building Data Assets as a Use Case. So this is uh, co-authored with uh, Dr. Heiko, who is with us here. And the preprint URL is available below. And uh, just to conclude, so the incentives, uh, which is the payment of money, they were used for cooperation uh, from the building owners. And the tokens that we use in our ecosystem, they are to coordinate the asset activities between the various stakeholders and the blockchain. We use it as a tool since it meets many of the building asset requirements that we had seen earlier. And we, present, we presented our solution architecture to enable building data assets. So with this, uh, we are able to bridge the gap between the buyer and the seller. And it allows valuable but hard to find building information accessible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sat, for the presentation. And um, I don't know, we can start the discussion and the question sessions. So, um, if you have any questions, right. I'll give you a mic so that the online audience is here. Yeah. Um, thank you, Sat. Actually, I'm questioning about context a bit more. Um, I want to be going back to the um, the path we are part of the circular future cities project. So the question about how does circularity, how does the contribute to actually circular future cities? Um, the particular problem that we have with uh, building and recycling and basically the circularity of it is that the lifetime of buildings is in decades. And uh, let's say several decades from now after the building has been constructed, um, and you wouldn't actually benefit from having the data knowing where is which part, which is which materials and which uh, component of the building. Um, by, but after that time, the information is typically not available anymore. In fact, the buildings that we have today, they have been built often decades ago and we didn't even have the internet right now. So the data isn't available, but then the question is, how do you incentivize anybody to keep that data available for such a long time period? Um, if, they, if it's not clear how this money, uh, how this uh, data could be monetized. It, it, first of all, it takes effort and therefore time and money to uh, collect and store this data, and then also you have to keep it somehow alive. Um, data storage over several decades is, is actually not trivial. Uh, secondly, companies that may have contract, various contractors that have been involved in constructing the building and therefore uh, having access to this data, they don't even exist anymore for decades from now. So the idea was if you would be able to turn this data into something valuable, then there might be incentive to keep this data alive over a long time. So that was the that was how the idea was born that we turn building data into an asset. So the idea is that it's not just data, it's actually an asset. And that requires that first of all, you have the requirements of uh, Sarah Bench theory, you can't just easily duplicate it. You need to have control. There needs to be some um, uh, I guess, uh, control in the terms of uh, regulation because building data is attached inevitably to the building and building is it's situated in a certain of, uh, country or certain jurisdiction. So that there may be, depending on where you are, you may have to have to uh, raise the control the data that's associated with that. The other thing about blockchain is that it allows uh, settlement in a very short time. Uh, Transacting buildings, the actual physical thing, takes months, it holds lawyers, and it's very expensive. 
it's not um, accept, uh, acceptable for the data that can be potentially very important. We use some of the data in a short period of time, we need to be able to get access to it. We, we can't involve lawyers that take months to secure something. So, as a pattern mindset, then blockchain is actually uh, very far, and it also works for boundaries, it's not limited to a particular jurisdiction. So, if you have companies that are specialized in, in collecting this building data information, keep it alive, and then basically monetize it several years from now, when it's actually interesting for companies to harvest the building materials. Um, they, they may not necessarily be in Singapore, and they, need to, they may be globalized. So, you need a global system, and system for the blockchain. Is, is, is good. Um, so, yeah, that, that's how it, it fits into this idea of a circular future city. Um, so, I just wanted to add this on for a bit more context. Thank you. So, is there any more questions from here? Great. <laughs> Thanks. So I would have a question about um, data privacy and uh, safety. Um, the address, the building, and the ownership, will that be part of the data the contractors gather? And um, how will it be ensured that not the wrong people get the data to maybe, um, yeah, to bad things with the information so in some sense uh, we do not um, have any totally identifiable information as part of the data and reporting but in some case if you are looking at a specific land parcel and there is so you are specific address and have an interest in about the building assets in that location then you probably already know what it corresponds to. But otherwise, uh, we do not uh, have any identifiable material on the blockchain or on the data store as such. Um, I, I would argue this is where the register comes in, because as I said, in this case, the building data is sort of associated, it, it invariably has to be associated with the building itself. So I wouldn't expect anyone to be allowed to put uh, digitized or organized data about buildings that are, let's say, critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. right? So you wouldn't see this about government buildings or you know, power plants. Mm -hmm. Or it could be done, but in such a way that then only certain parties have access to it. That is a very the requirement of the um, uh, the regulator who have access. I mean, it's not that the argument about blockchains and everything is decentralized and there is no central uh, regulating authority. But in the case of building data, um, because it is directly related to a physical asset, there is actually, it makes sense to have at least technically the possibility of having a regulator to have a certain control over the assets. Not necessarily to take it, you know, things away, but at least to serve, like, I guess it's a, a rule based system whereby certain actors cannot have access uh, the data if it's uh, somehow crucial to defense uh, or security purposes. So that would be my comment to that. Okay, I would have a follow up question now. Um, would I, as a building owner, um, could I decide who I'm going to sell the information to, or is this more? An open market principle with uh, the bids and the orders. I'm sure you could decide to send uh, sell it to a different person by simply having an opt-in agreement to give the money and to the transaction of the ownership tokens as of the person who you want to sell it to. But then this payment mechanism is not on on chain, so you need to somehow. We have two types of tokens, ownership and economic tokens. Ownership tokens control the ownership of the data asset. The economic token is serious capital. So if I had a building, right, and I would only get the information to certain institutions, I would not list this token anymore, right? So I would need to wait until someone finds me 
and maybe ask, hey, do you have a data token? You would sell here this in this institution. Yes, that's okay. the case. So this is going to be a separate entry. But mostly this is for publicly accessible data. The poor area of many businesses that they don't care if they lose a bit of money by with some information. As long as they feel that this information is not too crucial or critical, then they are happy to put it online and make some money out of it. Just to add on that um, as part of the CFC project, there's another work package. I think they actually looking into the discovery and didn't cover that. As I said, if you don't want to put it on an exchange, then you know it's, it's basically a private transaction. Yeah. Um, but discovery is an issue, and um, there's another work package um, they actually look into. Um, so maybe before we move to the other physical question, if there is someone online who wants to um, ask a question, unmute yourself. Go ahead. Okay, well, if not, then um, Peter. Yes, uh, thanks, Sarah. The clarification question um, to Aero. Um, explain how and what extent you can implement it, uh, this this scheme. Oh, nice. um, because of course, from from, the, from being in the project, I know more background. But in that sense, maybe uh, the people in the audience that only see a diagram, so perhaps it would be useful to highlight to what extent this uh, is happening. Yes, that's a good question. Um, we have implemented the tokenizing part. So we have we used the Ethereum Gully testnet for our implementations. So we did write a number of uh, smart contracts for that. So we have a smart contract to issue the NFTs, also the ownership and economic tokens. Then uh, we also have smart contract for a DEX. So we implemented our own DEX and Ethereum DEX um, on the Gully testnet and. Uh, there's a, there's a mechanism where uh, the stakeholders can buy and sell both the ownership tokens and the economic tokens of the text. And we also have implemented another smart contract for the consumers of information. They can pay the NFT uh, smart contract and uh, this, this fund are then proportionally split between the um, economic token holders and the ownership uh, token holders. So that's also implemented as part of the smart contract. So we have implemented everything that's related uh, to the blockchain or needs the blockchain in this uh, solution. We have implemented it. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. <clears throat> I have two questions. Uh, first, for the economy token, how should you uh, value the, how should the evaluation be done? Because like different restriction has different uh, rights for the, the different regulations. And second, uh, how do you audit or how do you verify the data assets? So the first question, I am not an expert in economics, so, but I'm sure that there's some kind of price discovery mechanism for the tokens uh, before they actually uh, put it up on the deck so they have some mechanism they, they research it and see what people are willing to what price people are willing to buy for these tokens and once some kind of price discovery can be decided offline and they can start selling it yeah, actually just to clarify it's not the building ownership of something it's the data about building and this is probably happens in the market i mean you, you know if the price of the thing is for the highest bidder is ready to pay for it. Um, the question is if someone finds the data, uh, if they have a directory of, you can get the schematics of any second collection files are, or in the files are, or in the complete slides are. So, someone who is quite interested in that I don't know making the government, you know, you put the thing in the harvest saying it's bubble wires because that happens to be of your interest. You may want to know where exactly all the couple wires are. So, data about uh, the wiring may actually be valuable to you. So, you may be willing to pay something for someone else. It might be an important paper that there's basically a market. 
Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question. How do you see this uh, uh, to update the information that is already possible in this uh, case? And uh, I'm asking this uh, thinking applications for the reuse of components and for the reuse of the material for assistive technology. Because all these uh, components and these components uh, may change. Uh, in a long time, in one year and ten years. So it is uh, uh, it is easy to update the information in this schema or or uh, once uh, one component has changed immediately then you have to create another another density. Um so just that's the last part. You might not have to create a new token that maybe but if things have not changed too much you can still change the information on the data store. Other part is that uh, who is going to be responsible for keeping track of all the changes over time. And so we either have the building owners or the building data management company. So if they're a management company, or sorry, if they're a management company, they are expected to keep track of uh, changes in the building ecosystem over time. So that's slightly an option. Yeah, that's actually an important point because um, the idea is that the, the original building owners at some point um, they don't necessarily have anything to do with it. They, they don't have any sort of value. But the yeah, idea is that there will be probably uh, companies emerging that specialize in handling this kind of um, data. Um, perhaps the, the data of one particular building is not so important, but if you have the data from the whole district, that becomes actually perhaps more valuable for, I don't know, again, for harvesting of materials. So you also need to make sure that this data is valuable um, in order to, for it to be valuable. You need to be up to date, you need to uh, you know, curate it, maintain it, and so on. So if something is changing in the buildings because there's been some, you know, some, some further construction or some maintenance work going on, you probably want to update the data and you know, keep it valuable for further use. All this, of course, um, assumes that these companies will be able to monetize the data, even during the lifetime of a building, right? right? Maybe so we have someone who's subscribing to your data. Maybe someone's interested in, in knowing about when certain things in the building need to be maintained. So they may want to know about the material that has to be used for the pipes, how old they are, I don't know, something, something. So they might be interested in some subscription thing. So every time there's a new data uh, available, you just get a sort of uh, thing and say, oh, there's something that's changed. Um, so that they will be able to, during the lifetime, to monitor the data, but then, of course, also during the, the phase when the building is, is, is demolished, when the, 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 the material harvesting begins, uh, to monetize the data again by telling people where exactly is what material, where to find what component. Um, just to add, uh, one of the data asset requirements is audit. So if you are able to have and an audit of all your data assets, mm -hmm. and you you say that this has been audited by such and such person who is a well-known authority, then you just publish it, the audited report, and then you have confidence that this information is up to date and correct. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I think while well, I ask maybe a similar question, I don't know if the discussion covered the answer for you, or would you like to um, speak to yourself? If so, you can use it. Yes, that has uh, answered my question. Uh, I have a follow-up question in terms of the revenue generation from the updated data. Do you expect the purchaser of the data to continue to pay to get more updated data, or they will automatically receive the updated data? Just uh, curious on how do you envision this process? Thank you. I would imagine that, for example, if this is a utility bill, then it's going to change every month. Every month you have a new bill. And uh, if you need new information, you're going to have to pay for it. But that's again the incentive to make this new data available in the first place. So yes, I would think that as new information is 
added into the ecosystem, then it needs to be paid for. Okay. Um, is there any more questions here uh, or online? We are uh, almost on time. So maybe then I will give a closing question if there's no other questions. So for me, I'm not uh, an expert in blockchain or digital tokens. Um, so for me, the question would be about that building owners are not often or more um, less often than not are not the users of the buildings. They're not the ones who maybe produce the data or generate the data. So what kind of role within the scheme you see of building users, what kind of daily implications tokenizing building data would create people entering buildings, people renting apartments, um, and so on. Okay, so in the case of uh, renting apartments, when I rented a new apartment in Singapore, so the first thing I was really interested is what would be the next month's electricity bill? What is it going to look like? Is it going to be hundreds of dollars or maybe $30, $50? But somehow this uh, information is not available because it's not being tokenized. And that means I would have to check with the apartment owner for the previous uh, month's utility bills. And if they are willing to give it to me, that's well and good. But otherwise, there is no way I have access to such information otherwise as a renter. But had that been tokenized on a blockchain, maybe if I could pay $10, $20 to the token and get this information, it would have been a very seamless process for me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you again for your presentation. And it's very exciting to see all the new um, services and businesses coming around together with this idea um, and how it could be, how could it support uh, the circularity in the cities.